Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishna Guru Murthy, and this is the podcast in which we talk to remarkable people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest today is an American author who only writes best-selling books. Madeline Miller wrote Song of Achilles over a period of 10 years, and it won the Orange Prize for Fiction. Her second book, Circe, was shortlisted for the same prize, which is now called the Women's Prize for Fiction. And as you can probably tell from the titles, both are works about the classics, rewrites, retelling of great uh, classic stories by Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey. Um, Madeline, welcome. Thank um, you. I would have expected a classicist to be a little afraid to rewrite, you know, the great <laughs> holy grails of classics. <laughs> You know, I, I was terrified in the beginning. I'm going to be totally honest. Um, for Song of Achilles, I actually, for that whole 10 years, I kept it completely secret from all my classical mentors, all my classical peers, because for just that reason, I sort of thought they were going to say, how dare you? Who do you think you are? Um, but first of all, the classics community has actually been in supportive in a really lovely way. Um, but on top of that, I think at some point I realized, you know, this tradition of retelling stories is as old as Homer himself. And Homer himself actually came out of oral tradition. And so, you know, why not me? It's been this long line. And and actually, I think there's a little bit of a, of a part of me. Traditionally in classics, women have actually been kept away from the epics. They've often been kind of pushed into the softer text, the less important text, art history, love poetry. And so there was something about, you know what, I'm going to claim this. I'm allowed to write about this. Well, what's extraordinary, though, is that you've taken these two uh, works that uh, you know, a lot of people in this country study at school mm -hmm. uh, to some extent, um, and you've turned them into hugely popular best-selling books no. <laughs> um, with young people as well. I mean, who were you writing for? Um, I mean, a lot of authors say this, and so it's kind of a cliche, but honestly, I wanted it to be for everyone, um, partially because I think Homer originally was for everyone. As I said, this was oral tradition. Um, these were stories that were told and retold from grandparents to grandchildren. And so I wanted um, to, you know, it to be the type of thing where if you knew the classics, there were lots of goodies in there for you. But if you didn't, this could be a way to bring you into the classics for the first time. How did you discover them? Uh, when I was five and six, my mom started to read me little pieces of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, she was a librarian, and um, I'm not I'm still not totally sure what possessed her, but I loved it. <laughs> so I, I was just sort of in love ever since. And you were a big reader as a child. I was. I was. Um, both Greek myths and pretty much anything, cereal boxes, whatever you handed me. I read one interview in which it said that you had been limited at one point in time as a child. Yes, that yes. Your, your dad had said you could only read for an hour a day. It was excruciating. It was amazing how excruciating it was. Why, why, why did that happen? You know, I was a very bookish child, and I think sometimes parents try to think, oh, my child is a nerdy, and, you know, we want to kind of help them. But honestly, as a high school teacher, I have found that the things that make you weird and nerdy are the things that, when you grow up, are the things that make you. So I encourage weirdness. <laughs> and were you a nerdy child? Oh, I mean, definitely. In, the, in, the, in those terms? Um, I was very, I was, I mean, I, I read literally as I walked. Because quite unusual at that age to be, to be <laughs> looking at Homer. I, I just, you know, I think I loved stories. I just loved stories. And Did you I, understand and I the, the language? Um, I, no. <laughs> um, I think I understood, you know, maybe 50%, but that was still potent enough to really resonate with me. I mean, just even that first line of the Iliad, sing goddess of the destructive rage of Achilles, which brought so many griefs to the Greeks, is immediately like, wow, this is, he's a Greek. Why is he bringing so many griefs to his own people? Sort of the mystery and the excitement of it brought me right in. At, at, at five? Well, I mean, you know, Five, six, seven, then onwards. You know, as soon as I could kind of read it myself, read the, the myths themselves, um, I started doing that. And then the real revelation, I think, really came, honestly, in high school. I had a wonderful Latin teacher who saw that I was obsessed with these stories and offered to teach me Homeric Greek. And so that's really when I was kind of off to the races. And so w when did you read them in Greek? Uh, so I started reading the Iliad with him when I was around 17. And then I headed off to college and continued to, to read them in Greek 
and and to study Greek and and Latin as well. So, um, but I Virgil was one of my first and still great loves in Latin and and um, you know I thought I had loved these stories before, but reading them in the original was just mind-blowing to me. Um, what was the appeal? I mean, I think, you know, in Britain, we, we kind of only have one famous classicist mm. at the moment, <laughs> and that's unfortunately <laughs> Boris Johnson, um, and, and um, who, who you may, may or may not know um, is, is, is a leading politician here. Um, so what was it that, that you liked about that language and those stories? Uh, I think I loved the I loved the poetry of it. I loved how powerful it was. Um, I also loved the fact that you know I have never. Sometimes people ask me, "How do you make Greek myths relevant?" Um, I don't feel I have to do anything at all. I felt that when I was reading them, I was reading stories about humanity. I was reading stories about people today. I was reading sort of about timeless emotions of grief and pain and ambition and hope and love. And that something about the myths and Homer and, and ancient poetry in general sort of blew it up so that you could really live in it and and feel it. Um, and so I think that was it was it was the characters really in the stories that I loved. The first book took you 10 years. Mm. Why? Um, a couple reasons. I was teaching full time Latin and Greek. Um, I was also directing plays, Shakespeare plays. So I had some other things going on in my life at the same time. And I could mostly only write sort of on vacations and holidays. Um, that was a piece of it. But the other piece of it was that I was learning how to write a novel. And I really was learning how to do the justice to these characters that I wanted to do to them. Um, I really wanted to be able to hear Patroclus's voice in my head and to have that be a really authentic and real voice. Um, and around five years in, I actually had a completed manuscript that I started to move um, towards agents and possibly going to publishers with it. And I ended up pulling it because I, I thought I hadn't gotten the voice right. So I needed another five years on top of that to, to sort of feel like, OK, I've I've done all the justice I can do. That, that, that story is about uh, Pat Patroclus and his relationship with Achilles. Mm -hmm. um, this relationship is about Circe. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, how different is it writing in the voice of a man and a woman for you? You know, for me, the the real difference was between human and goddess. <laughs> that, that was the that was the difficulty, um, and and in a sense, I sort of felt like I was doing opposite things with the genre. So, you know, with Song of Achilles, I was taping taking a story that has traditionally been epic, and I was telling it in an intimate and lyric way. Um, and with Circe, I felt like I was taking the story of this woman's life, and women's lives have traditionally been kept out of epic. They've been seen as not as a, not important important enough for epic and giving it epic scope and, you know, letting her sort of take her rightful place at, at the center of the story. So um, in a sense, I felt like I was doing I was doing slightly different things with them. Uh, but definitely the challenge of, you know, this person has lived for millennia was was an interesting one. I mean, this has been taken up as a, as a, as a piece of feminist literature. Yes. And is, is that how you intended? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the very first time that I read the Odyssey sort of under my own steam, I was 13 and I was incredibly frustrated by the flatness of the portrait of Circe, how unexplored it was. Um, she's presented as this terrifying witch who, you know, menaces Odysseus's men, turns them into pigs, and then Odysseus sort of tames her, they become lovers. and. No one ever asks her, why are you turning men into pigs? Which was sort of shocking to me. It seems like that's a pretty key question, but people didn't ask her. Um, and so I wanted to kind of dig into her psychology, but also I really wanted to give her much more room, that she's just a cameo in Odysseus's story. So I wanted to flip that, and now he's the cameo in her story. But part of sort of thinking of this in a, in a feminist way, it wasn't just Circe that I wanted to give voice to. I wanted to give voice to a number of other women that sort of show up in the course of the story who have often also been kind of flattened or silenced or pushed to the side. And men as well, particularly men who are seeking non-traditional paths. So, you know, one of the significant characters of the novel is Telemachus, Odysseus' son, who I think it would be I think he finds it very difficult to be the son of Odysseus, and he's looking to sort of find his own way instead of being the traditional Bronze Age hero. Um, he wants something else. And so, you know, in a society that is constricting 50% of its population, it's not actually 50%. It's much more than that. Uh, had you found it frustrating reading the classics and 
seeing how women... I mean, women, all, all women in the classics are basically portrayed terribly. Yes, yes. There are, you know, there are some authors who are better than others, um, but there, was, there, were, there were a number of kind of striking moments when I was studying classics, particularly at the graduate level and, and undergraduate level, where I would be in a classroom, we would be reading a scene, particularly from the Metamorphoses, it would be a rape scene, and everyone was kind of just calmly talking about the meter and no one was saying, and I, and I was the only, often the only woman in the room. Um, and it was, it was really, I was sort of like, is anyone else noticing? Are they noticing, but they're waiting for me to say something? What's, what's this dynamic here? Um, and so it's very exciting that we're at this moment where we're going back to these texts, we're allowing the silenced voices, the voices of women, of slaves, um, of you know, secondary characters, of queer characters, as in the case of, of Patroclus and Achilles, and we're allowing their voices and their stories to be heard as well. I mean, you, you have specifically taken up a, a, a sexual violence story yes. uh, in, in Circe. What, how did you approach that in telling it from her perspective? You know, I think that there's been a little bit of this thing that happens in our culture right now where sort of sexual assault and rape is used as kind of almost like a titillating plot point. Um, it's sort of oftentimes, traditionally, it's been used to motivate the male hero. The woman is attacked and that affects the male hero story. So obviously not doing that. Um, what I really wanted to do is, is focus in on Cersei's story and how this affects her, but also how it is, it is a key traumatic piece of her experience, but it is not her entire experience. And that the road to working through that kind of trauma is messy and complicated and, you know, takes a long time. So I really just wanted to focus in on the character. I didn't want it to stand for every woman out there, but I wanted it to be true to who I felt Cersei was and to give her her time to grieve and be angry and mourn and sort of change the way she feels in the world. When were you writing that, that bit and where did it fit into the Me Too phenomenon? Um, so I was in final edits when a lot of the Me Too news stories were breaking. So I was actually writing it before that. Um, but it was both incredibly depressing to see just how much we are still dealing with these exact same things. And there's so many ancient stories about women that are, I mean, literally ripped from the headlines. There's um, this young nymph in the Aeneid who's raped by Zeus and he literally gives her a payoff in order to keep her quiet about it. He makes her a goddess so that she won't be angry and cause a fuss. It's like, wow, that is happening right now. Um, and so I had always believed that, that these stories are incredibly resonant with modern day, but it was, it was quite disturbing to see just how relevant. Cersei's response, which is revenge, and to turn men into pigs. Yes. Um, how, how, do you, how do you feel that fits into today and how women feel about men in that, in that scenario? Mm. Well, first of all, I love the fact I didn't know this at the time because I don't speak French. Um, but apparently the Me Too movement in France is called, the, is like name your pork, um, name your pig, which is amazing. So I, di I didn't know that, but that was very exciting to learn. Um, but I actually, when thinking of that scene and those moments, I wanted to go back to the Odyssey, which is, was always kind of my, my grounding point. And I think nowadays we often talk about sort of, you know, sex is pig, men are pigs, pigs are bad, men are bad, you know, that sort of whole chain. But that chain is actually not really in sort of the ancient pagan worldview, that pigs were in the ancient Greco-Roman world animals of sacrifice. They were often associated with goddesses in particular. And so what Circe is doing in that moment in the Odyssey is actually much more mysterious than that. Um, it's much more mysterious than men are bad, men are pigs. You know, it's, it's some sort of mystical transformation that she is trying to give them. So in my interpretation of that scene, Circe is, it's, it, it isn't that simplicity. I wanted it to be a much deeper thing that she's reaching for in that moment. Is it disappointing that Circe takes Odysseus as a lover? No, you know, it, by the time I was writing that scene, it really wasn't because I think that Circe is a survivor and at the moment when she meets Odysseus, she is in a very difficult place in her life, and she recognizes in him another survivor. I mean, he is the great charmer of ancient literature. Um, and I think she 
is looking to be to be charmed and to be sort of lifted out of the place she's been in. But I think she, in some ways, recognizes a kindred spirit in him. But one thing about Odysseus that we can give him credit for is that he does truly seem to appreciate women in a slightly different way than many of the ancient heroes. Um, I think he genuinely loves his wife, even though he sleeps his way across the Mediterranean. Um, he, he does, you know, really respect his wife. And their marriage of Penelope and Odysseus is the closest thing we get almost to sort of an equal heterosexual relationship from ancient mythology. And so I think Circe would be, my Circe was, was drawn to that that he actually appreciates women as sort of intelligent beings. So it, it made sense to me why she would be drawn to him. I mean, how much everyday sexism have you encountered in publishing? I mean, publishing is quite a female industry. Yes. It? So is that good from your point of view? I mean, I think it's I think it's wonderful. It's been it's been very um, I, I feel like I'm taken care of by this sort of array of witch goddesses <laughs> who look out for my work. Um, so it's been lovely. But there are some I, that includes men. That's, you know, men and women who are who are witch goddesses. Um, I have not I feel like I have not experienced directly a lot of that, but I, I know it's out there. And I think that a lot of it is much more general. I haven't sort of experienced the stuff that's directed at me in publishing, but things like, um, I feel that we're much more apt to want to read a woman, to sort of know a woman's story and read her books in light of her story as if sort of women can't invent anything. They only can sort of write about what they know. Um, I think women's fiction you know, the idea that there is fiction that is written by women that's just for women. I love that the Women's Prize is fighting back against that and saying this is fiction written by women for everyone. Um, so I feel like that those things are out there. Um, there was sort of an infamous thing about how there was American novelists and then women American novelists, as if sort of they had to be, again, the subcategory. Um, I think that was on Wikipedia or something like that. And, but I, I think, you know, Hopefully, the culture is changing, and as there's more awareness of that, that starts to come up less. And what about before that at, at university? I mean, when you said you were often the only woman in the room. Um, I was fortunate to have some amazing mentors, um, men and women both, who were incredibly supportive of me. I did have a few kind of horror stories, um, one of which was, uh, I will not name where I was because I, I went to a couple different institutions, but this person shall, shall remain nameless. Um, but it was the first day of, of Greek history, and the professor said, I don't want to hear any questions about women and slaves. This is a course about history, Greek history. and. I, my jaw just dropped, you know, and I think that that is such a shocking idea that history, you know, doesn't belong to women and slaves. It only, you know, history is only the battles and the speeches given by, you know, privileged men. I mean, that what a, but I think that in many ways has been the assumption for, for years. And so, um, I decided to write my paper for that course on the role of slaves at the Battle of Thermopylae. Um, everyone likes to talk about the 300 Spartans and their brave stand, um, but they were able to have that brave stand because they had thousands of slaves fighting with them. I mean, it kind of comes back to sort of what, what it is that has brought you to this whole world, because so much of um, you know, these original texts are about battles and mm -hmm. wars, yes. and wars that go on for years and years and years. Yes. Um, I mean, do you, do you like that? Um, I think, I, I mean, I, I hate war and I, and I loathe violence and I'm completely horrified by it. But it is clear that it is one of those things that humanity reaches for again and again in our history. So I think I'm drawn to it in the sense of I want to understand it and I want to make the people who suffer in it visible not just the people who are dying on the battlefield. And I, I think this is very much within Homer, actually. You know, if you read the Iliad in the original Greek, you learn all the vocabulary for the internal organs because men's bodies are being torn apart throughout the entire Iliad. It is impossible to read the Iliad and think that Homer is pro-war because he is so clear about the physical violence um, and what happens to men's bodies in war and how brutal and disgusting and gory it is. Um, but at the same time, 
I very much want to bring in sort of the collateral damage. You know, all how do the Greeks stay at Troy for 10 years? They stay there because they are attacking um, all the villages surrounding Troy, burning them, stealing from them, taking their daughters as slaves. Um, killing them. I mean, there's just basically this wholesale slaughter going on, and I wanted those voices to be heard. And I, so I, I feel like it's really important to, to acknowledge the brutality um, of war for everyone. And, and are you evangelical in a way about bringing these stories to a modern audience by I, rewriting them in such a contemporary way? I mean, I always have my Latin teacher agenda, you know, that's secretly <laughs> under the surface. <laughs> So that so you so say yes. Yes. But you've also said you're not going to do any more, haven't you? Um, no more. I For right now, I mean, I can only write these stories if I'm completely obsessed with the character's story. And so um, for right now, I think I have written about the two characters from Homer that have been really possessing me. And so I'm, I'm going to let Homer go. Um, right now, the two things that are drawing me are actually the Aeneid, which I mentioned is the other sort of great ancient love of my life, and... Um, Shakespeare's Tempest, which has been with me a really long time, sort of rattling around in my brain. So I'm, I'm not sure which one's going to come first. I'm, I'm leaning Tempest, but I, I'm not sure. And do you think there is, well, clearly you, you must think that there is space for another take on Shakespeare. I do. I mean, and Shakespeare is so, it's so interesting to work with his characters because um, Unlike the Greek myths, he is so brilliant about psychology and so just wonderful about bringing internal monologues to life and um, motivations to life. Uh, I think I, I would be interested in sort of a what next question. You know, here are these two people, these two, you know, sort of children of Prospero, one kind of an adopted um, hated, tortured child and one his daughter, Caliban and Miranda. Uh, okay, they've been raised on this island. They've lived on this island their whole life with only Prospero shaping their worldview. Can they go into the world? So that's sort of what I'm, I'm interested in. It's not, not retelling the part that Shakespeare tells, but now what? What do you think the, the primary roles of reading novels are? I mean, are, are we reading to learn, to be entertained, or all of the above? I think that, for me, I think one of humanity's greatest gifts is empathy. And I think that that is the work of fiction, that, that fiction's job is to exercise that empathy, to allow us to live in someone else's life, to imagine ourselves in their life. And sometimes that life is a life we might want to reject. But more often, it invites us into see other perspectives and to to sort of, you know, walk a mile in someone else's in someone else's shoes and try and um, understand people who feel quite distant from us, but actually when we live in their life, we realize that we share so many things. So I, I for me, fiction is vital in terms of, of empathy. And honestly, that's, that's really the theme of both the novels, that empathy is, is so important to both Patroclus' story and to Circe's story. And do you think we have empathy, or is it, or is it a... A, a, a reducing thing in the society that we live in? Well, it's hard because actually psychological studies have addressed this, that the more power, money, and privilege that you have, if you don't fight against it, and it is possible to counteract it if you are thinking about it, but if you don't fight against it, your empathy level drops. And that's just what happens to human psychology. We start to think, oh, I have all this power and privilege. I must have earned it. And if no one else has it, they must have not earned it. And then we start to, you know, sort of that's just how the human brain works unless you, unless you actively fight against it. Um, so I think that's definitely something we're seeing in our society right now that, you know, particularly, I don't know if it's the same here, but in America, there's huge wealth disparity. There's this enormous wealth gap between the people who are the, you know, multi-billionaires and kind of everyone else. And some people who are multi-billionaires are doing wonderful charitable work, and I really appreciate that, but I think a lot of them, you know, their lives are so outside of anyone else's life that they basically become Greek gods. And I'm not sure that their empathy is really in place. How comfortable do you feel in, in modern America? I mean, you grew up in New York. Um, a lot of people wonder if that's actually America, I suppose, yeah. in, the way, in the way that people <laughs> wonder whether London is Britain. Okay. Um, but, I mean, how, how comfortable do you feel in your country at the moment? I mean, at the time of this interview, Donald Trump's in London, um, and there's a lot of sort of, um, you know, introspection going on about the kinds of societies we've become. Yes. 
Uh, I feel I feel very uncomfortable in America right now, actually, to be honest. Um, last year and the last couple years on 4th of July, I just sort of had this feeling of I'm having so much trouble having any sort of pride in, in what it means to be an American. Um, I think that this horrible sort of like fetid, past is coming up and just sort of engulfing the country right now. But um, I do see some hope. Uh, I think that, first of all, it's bringing to light some things that we needed to be talking about, that we had sort of, people had kind of, oh, isn't that fixed? Isn't racism fixed in America? No, it's not. And it's this incredibly virulent, um, horrific force in American politics and has been for a long time. And, 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 you know, so many people suffer from it daily. And we needed to be having that conversation. And I think, so the silver lining is, I think we are now starting to have more of those conversations. I mean, just unpack that a little bit, because a lot of people don't really understand why you would say racism is a powerful force in American politics. Mm. What do you mean by that? I mean, I was just reading an article um, the other day that was talking about how one of the main things that held back um, women getting the vote in America was that conservatives didn't want to give the vote to black women because they had basically found a way to shut black men out of the polls sort of through all these sneaky loopholes, even though technically they could vote, actually they weren't being allowed to vote and that they were afraid that would sort of open it back up again. And so some of the white suffragettes sort of sacrificed that. They, they kind of knew that that racist idea was out there and they were kind of like, you know, they rolled with it in order to get to get the vote for women as sort of the greater good. But what a horrifying, I mean, just, you know, at every moment in our history, um, racism has, I mean, I, I think it's the, it is in many ways the, the original sin of our country. And when people talk about reparations, I actually think that that makes total sense to me in terms of America actually needs to acknowledge what it owes to the people that it has oppressed and made suffer for so many years. Do you think we can escape these cycles, though? I mean, you know, a, a lot of people now think, you know, we're on a trajectory. Um, we've got populist leaders around the world. Mm -hmm. There's lots of bitterness and division that's been exposed. And we are on this sort of um, unstoppable course mm -hmm. towards things getting worse. I mean, do, do, you know, as somebody who's spent your life studying classic stories and old stories, do you feel you can escape these cycles? or not? I think you can. I think it takes a lot of will. And I guess that's where the hope comes from, is that I feel that I see people engaging in American politics in a way that they haven't in the past. People who were never political in my life before are now up on the news, and they're going to marches, and they're calling their representatives. And so engagement has really risen, and that's where the hope is. And I always put, I mean, maybe this is my high school teacher, but I always put the hope in, in the younger generation, too. I think they're they are passionate, and they're informed, and they're really sick of us blowing it. So I hope that I hope that you know I want to empower them as much as possible to to kind of take the reins from us crashing the car or the people who are driving. Hopefully, I'm not crashing the car <laughs> from from the people who are driving crashing the car, um, particularly about things like climate change. And um, so there, I think there is hope, and I think history tells us that. But I think history also tells us that that we can't just sit back and hope. We have to engage and we have to speak out and we have to call our representatives and, you know, sort of marshal our resources. Because where, where do you live now? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. So do, do you feel in Philadelphia or that little East Coast belt mm -hmm. that you have anything in common with the people living in middle America? I mean, you know, I think that there, yes, yes and no. I mean, I think it's, there's a part of me that finds it really hard to uh, think about, to find connection with people who can look at everything our president is doing and be totally fine with it. Children in cages, I, I don't know. I find it really hard to, to bridge that. I, I'm not sure I can. Um, but at the same time, I also understand that people are motivated by fear, their own insecurity and their own fears. And am I going to be able to pay my bills? And, you know, my mother has cancer. Are we going to be able to take her to the hospital? Is she going to be able to get care? This sort of profound insecurity that, again, that, that huge wealth disparity is driving. And on that level, I, I you know, of course want to reach out to people and, and sort of say, but, you know, there, there's this huge propaganda arm that's been happening for a long time in America of, of you know, Fox News and, 
And I think people genuinely at this point um, are only getting their news from there. And so, of course, their vision of what's going on is skewed. So I would love to find a way to break through that. And, you know, because I, I think if people understood and, and tapped into their empathy, we could, we could go forward. Because it's quite shocking to hear an American saying, you know, they feel ambivalent about the 4th of July. You know, that, that's quite a British thing, you know, so we, we, we're not sure about the flag, we don't, you know, we're sort of, we're, we're a bit uncomfortable with sort of um, national pride and patriotism and all that kind of thing. But, in, you know, we, we've always seen Americans as very straightforward about these things. Mm. You know, I, I have, uh, I love America for so many reasons. Um, and and I'm, I'm proud to be there. But because I'm, I love America, I want it to do, I want it to be its best self. And that is not who it is right now. And so I think that's what it is. Um, you know, just this morning, actually, I was I was reading a Frederick Douglass letter, um, and it was a letter he had sort of published to his old his former master, uh, and the letter was just like this pure tonic to my spirit. And I think you know that is an American hero. Frederick Douglass is an American hero. You know, and I want to I want to be sort of acknowledging. So I, I feel tremendous pride when I when I read his work, and I think, wow. You know, that is an American that I am honored to call myself an American with. So there, there, is, there is pride there and excitement, but I, I, I think America has fallen off her ideals and her constitution, and I, I think the will is there to, to bring us back. I hope, that, I hope it is. Are you still teaching? Um, I tutor. I, I'm writing now full-time, and I have two young kids, so I cannot, uh, I, I cannot teach full-time. And do you find it easy to engage your own kids and the kids you're teaching with the kinds of stories, the complex, old, slow stories that have gripped you your life? Um, I, it, in my experience, it never fails, actually, that I think kids see just how powerful these stories, they're also wildly inappropriate, these stories. I mean, they're filled with murder and incest and vengeance and bestiality. I mean, they're really, it's kind of shocking me to actually teach them to children because they're filled with so much um, just violence and sort of the, the base instincts as well as beautiful things. So I think students immediately connect with them because they feel like they're getting something real. They feel like no one is sugarcoating. Not that I don't love, you know, Winnie the Pooh as well, because I do, but I think that student, it's sort of like this electric shock when, when students actually encounter them and realize how potent these stories are. And quite shocking lines. Yes, yes. What, why, I mean, why do you think the, I mean, when, when you say all those things about bestiality and, 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 and rape and violence and all those things, why um, do you think Homer is... Uh, shy about homosexuality? I'm not even sure he, he necessarily is. I mean, the, the debate about sort of are Achilles and Patroclus lovers or are they not kind of goes, you know, Homer doesn't tell us that they are. We see Achilles, you know, desiring women and therefore they're not together. And then the other side is, well, Homer doesn't have to say that they're together because it would have been completely obvious to an ancient audience. And we'll never get back to Homer's intention because we don't even know if he was a person. Um, but what we do know is that ancients believed some ancient authors absolutely read the Iliad and the Odyssey as sort of, or sorry, not the, not the Odyssey, but the Iliad as a love story, you know, with Achilles and Patroclus at the center. Plato takes them as ideal lovers and their other. So that tradition of them as lovers was an established interpretation in the ancient world, um, as well as the interpretation of them as the closest of friends. And so I think those are both valid. And I partially I wrote Song of Achilles because I was incredibly frustrated that the interpretation of them as lovers had it felt like to me, been kind of forcibly closeted in recent years. And how, how populist or how simple do you think we should get with trying to bring these stories to new audiences? I mean, what, what's your view of Percy Jackson? For example. I, I am so grateful to Rick Reardon. I have had so many students who come to my class and say I'm here because of Percy Jackson, so bless him. <laughs> Good stepping stone. Yes, yes, it is. It is. And, and, and as I said, I feel like this is exactly in line with Homer um, and the fact that these stories belong to everybody and everyone was tinkering with them and retelling them. And so, you know... In so, so this is not the preserve of the elite is what I'm, what I'm getting at. Yes, yes. I don't think it is. And I, I don't think it should be. How, but how, you see, I mean, because I think a lot of teachers might say that they would struggle to take this subject matter 
to a lot of their, their classrooms? What, what's your advice on that? I mean, to me, it just takes a little bit of sort of digging into the story. I mean, you know, take the character of Cassandra. This is a woman who the god Apollo tries to rape her. She manages to fight him off, and he curses her to tell the truth and never be believed. I mean, that is a story we are telling today. I think a lot of women can connect with that story. Um, the story of the Trojan refugees, which is you know the entire story of the Aeneid, and how much they suffer and the pain of watching their city destroyed and trying to find a new homeland and feeling lost in the world. That is the story we are telling today. I mean, all these stories are human stories, and they are... I, I feel like those connections are, are all there. Emily Wilson, um, the scholar who just came out with a new translation of the Odyssey, I feel like brings that out in really interesting and exciting ways. And she sort of delves into some of these things that we've overlooked. For instance, in the Odyssey, um, there are 12 women who Odysseus, who Odysseus orders killed at the end of the Odyssey. They have been sleeping with the suitors, he says. Therefore, they have betrayed him and his house. They must be killed and, you know, to purify. And um, they, those women have been called the maids traditionally in translations. Um, the word in Greek is female slave, which has a whole different meaning to us. Um, when we say maids, we're implying, oh, maybe they get paid, maybe they go home at the end of the day, maybe they have some choice about who they sleep with. When we acknowledge that they're slaves, we have to acknowledge this is a slave society. These women would have had no choice, and Odysseus, theoretically the hero, kills them anyway. And I feel like, as a teacher, you can say, let's look at that moment. Let's sit with it. It's uncomfortable, but let's sit with it. We have to sit with it. Um, and it's so much better to, to acknowledge those moments and, and take them head on. And I think they can be teaching. They can be wonderful teaching tools. If you take, you know, 10 different um, translations of Ovid and look at sort of particular scenes, you can see certain translators are soft peddling the sexual assault and the rape moments. They're obscuring them. What, a, what an interesting thing for a Latin teacher to teach. You know, why is this being covered over? Look, on, look what the Latin says. Now look what, now look what we're actually, um, what we're saying in English, why? Why that gap? So I feel like you can use these texts in such wonderful ways that honors the original text. And do you feel that contemporary America is about to do all of that again with women and, and, and sexual politics? I mean, if you look at where abortion laws are going in so many states at the moment? I, I, I mean, I, I think I and a lot of women particularly, I mean, this is so fresh. This is like in the last two weeks. And I think a lot of women and me are just struck dumb with horror. Um, and a lot of men that I know too, who are, you know, supportive of, of women. I, I hope that, you know, this, this fight has been brewing a long time in America. And, you know, maybe we just need to have it out. I don't know. Um, but it's like it's, it's, it's been going on for so long that none... I think I didn't really expect to see states passing laws. I kind of yep. thought this would just be an argument that goes on for years and years and years. Yep. Now it's actually happened. Yep, yep. Um, I mean, every woman I know, myself included, has been giving money like crazy to services in America that support women and support women as the agents of their own bodies as opposed to giving their bodies over to, to the state to control. Um, I, I hope that the courts will protect us, but I, I don't. But why would you think that, given who's been appointed to the court? Yes, yes. Oh, I know. Believe me. As you can see, I'm kind of speechless about it, honestly. Um, and I, don't, don't you now feel that you're on a trajectory, an inevitable trajectory to this, going to the Supreme Court, and then the, major, the conservative majority on the Supreme Court that has now been reached mm. Mm. will pass a ruling? I mean, I, I hope that we do have a swing vote, you know, the Chief Justice himself, and I hope that he looks deep within his soul and makes the choice of, of right and justice for women. Um, I, I, that is, of course, my fear. What you're describing is, is, is the nightmare scenario. Um, but I think then, if we imagine what's going to happen, I think, as always, the people who suffer are going to be the people who are the poorest people in America. Because people who, they're, not all states are going to pass those laws. There are going to be lots of states. Massachusetts is going to lead the way, you know. 
hopefully Pennsylvania will also be there in terms of, of you know, California. There will be lots of major states who are going to be protecting women's rights and who are actually passing unprecedented laws to protect those rights. So that's very positive. And, of course, women who, um, who have money in the states where, you know, women are, are not allowed to have abortions and not allowed to make choices about their own lives will be able to go to those states and seek help. But, as always, the people who are going to bear the cost are the women who don't have the resources to do that, who can't take a day off of work, who can't pay for, for transportation. Um, and, and if we're really in the nightmare scenario, you know, um, thinking about whether or not you will still be criminalized for having gone somewhere else to do it, uh, to have an abortion or, or to get the care you need. So it's, it's scary. It's a scary time. And do, do you think this is the struggle now for women? I mean, there are so many struggles for, for, for women um, in, in, in the modern world. Is, is, is this the one that goes, everyone says, everyone on this one now? I mean, I think part of the problem right now is that there are so many things that we need to be addressing. And that, it, yeah, I mean, this is absolutely one of the things. But as I said, what we are doing to refugees at the border, the fact that we are separating children from their families and keeping them in cages, I mean, that must be addressed immediately. Um, I think, I think, it's horrific. It's absolutely horrific. So that is horrific, and this is horrific, and 10 other things are hor horrific. And I think, you know, the, the rise of white nationalism and white supremacy and the racism and the neo-Nazi movement, I mean, that has to be addressed immediately. So I think we're all sort of, uh, I hope we can divide ourselves up, and I think it all needs to be addressed. Do, do you ever, I mean, you, you're, you're very strikingly passionate about this. Um, do you, do you ever feel like entering the fray yourself, politically? Um, I mean, I I try and, and enter it. You mean I, to become a politician? Yeah. I think I would be a horrendous politician. <laughs> I think I would be absolutely awful. Um, but I, I try and speak out as much as possible in, in my life. Um, I try and support politicians that I believe in. And, of course, I feel like, you know, I think art can transform, and I think art can speak to people in ways. Um, art can can get past people's defenses in ways that politicians can't necessarily. So we're talking about ways to change the world. Yeah. Um, if if you get to choose, how are you going to change it? I I mean I I hope that people will partially through my books. I would say partially. I, I hope that that people can can read these books and and feel a different way, um, and sort of have their perspective expanded and welcome in something that they didn't think belonged in their life, but actually they realize, do, they, they realize does belong in their life. Um, I've had so many people come up to me and say, um, I never thought I would read a gay love story, but I really enjoyed Song of Achilles, and it's really changed the way I think that to me is the highest honor. It means so much to me. And, and I've had lots of, lots of men come and say, um, Cersei really expanded the way I thought about what women struggle with. I had a, a mother, one of the, my favorite interactions I think I've had about Cersei was, was a woman who said, my son is going off to college. I bought a copy of Cersei for him and every one of his male friends, and I am giving it to them. And I'm saying, read this and then go off to college and think about consent and think about what it means to be a woman in the world and how you need to be sort of placing yourself in the world. I mean, that is like, wow. Um, so partially through that, but I also... Uh, I, I, I do feel that storytelling, whether it's through the theater, whether it's through writing, or whether it's through my teaching, I, I do think that stories can, can move us in ways that, you know, we look at a fact sheet, and humans are such emotional creatures. You know, we can look at a fact sheet, and, and it doesn't sort of hit us, but stories, they, they get in there, and they transform. That has happened to me so many times in my own life, and so I hope that I can be part of you know, I hope I can be part of stories transforming people and increasing their empathy and allowing them to make the world a better place. Madeline Miller, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. For sharing your ways to change the world. A pleasure to talk to you. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, then please do give us a rating and a review. Our producer is Sarah Goff. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>